Have you ever finished a set of drawings, sent them out thinking that was it, and then later been hit with a dozen questions from the architect and builder that you didn't expect? Well, that's definitely happened to me. And even though I thought my design was clean and logical, in reality, there are a bunch of little things in the drawings that would have made the construction way harder or even impossible in some cases. And it wasn't because the engineering was wrong, it was because I'd made a bunch of small everyday design decisions without taking some key factors into consideration. Today I'm going to be sharing what these key factors are that'll turn your structural designs into gold. Designs that builders trust, designs that architects don't need to work around, and designs that just come together cleanly on site without any surprises. Now, if there's one thing that instantly separates clean, buildable designs from messy ones, it's rule number one, constructability first. As a structural design engineer working in an office, when we're deep in modeling and analysis mode, running numbers, refining loads, tweaking member sizes, it's really easy to forget that someone has to physically put our design together, whether that be in a workshop or on site, with tools, cranes, and limited tolerance. The engineering might be perfectly fine structurally, but if the bolts can't be reached, a rattle gun doesn't fit, or members come together with zero room for adjustment, the builder, they're gonna struggle. And that's when they're gonna start calling, asking for a redesign, or worse, modifying the detail on their own. So the mindset shift here is simple. Keep things practical, add tolerance, and ensure what you've designed can physically be put together. In concrete design, check things like bar congestion, layering, size, and bend radiuses. And in steel design, check things like bolt tolerances, accessibility to connections, and how different member connections actually marry together. When your designs are more forgiving and practical, everything else downstream just becomes easier. You'll get fewer RFIs, the builders will be happier, and there'll just be less surprises during construction. Now, once you're comfortable that your designs are buildable, the next step is making sure that they can even get to site in the first place. Which brings us to rule number two, think transport. Now, when you're just starting out, it can be very easy to do things like specify a massively long member with no splice, or very tempting to say that something needs to be fully welded in the workshop because it's simple and easy from an engineering point of view. But if your 20 meter long roof beam doesn't fit on a truck, or your perfectly welded frame can't physically be transported through suburban streets, you've created a logistical problem. The workshop is gonna be contacting you asking for a redesign, and you're gonna be stuck in a tricky situation where they're gonna be wanting a solution fast. So as soon as you start working on anything remotely wide or long, ask yourself, can they move this? Straight away, this will get you thinking about how you wanna break up your members into transportable lengths and also give you plenty of time to add intentional splice details that work for you structurally and also architecturally. Now, once you've solved the transport side of things and made sure that everything can actually get to site, the next challenge is making sure that the builder isn't gonna be dealing with 20 different types of connections. And that brings us to rule number three, which is standardize everything you can. When you're early in your career, creating a custom detail feels clever. It feels like you're crafting a unique solution for every problem. But from a fabrication point of view, every unique detail is a new setup, a new bolt pattern, and a new risk of human error. It adds time, it adds cost, and it adds opportunities for mistakes. Now, of course, this has to be a balance because we can't just specify the same connection detail for every size of beam in every instance, but you can rationalize this a bit. Where possible, you can use the same connection for all the same member types and provide a table of how things change for different sizes. Likewise, on the concrete construction side of things, you could group columns carrying similar loads together and provide a typical punching shear and extra reinforcement layout for these columns columns so things aren't different every time. So in general, simplify where possible. A standardized job isn't just cheaper and faster, it's easier to read, easier to check, and makes you look more like a seasoned engineer. Although even with perfect standardization, there's still a few teams that will expose you instantly if you don't consider them early. And that's the guys installing the finishes. Which brings me to rule number four, which is respect the finishes. Now you can design a structurally flawless system 
but if it clashes with the finishes, you lose every time. Because if your base plate sticks out in a glazed facade, your top plate connection hangs down below the ceiling line, or your bolts clash with window mullions, the architect is gonna be asking for a redesign, the build is gonna call you frustrated, and the cost and complexity will spike instantly. So make sure that you bake finishes into your thinking from day one. Recess column base plates inside glazing lines, make top connections flush so they sit inside slabs, and generally just check how your connections marry in with facades and ceilings. When your structure disappears cleanly into the architectural intent, that's when you know you're designing at a higher level and your projects will run a lot smoother. Now, one thing that's not always in your control as the design engineer, but definitely needs to be noted if it's critical, is anything to do with construction sequencing. And that brings us to rule number five, which is make erection sequencing obvious. But before we move on, I wanna quickly mention the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Now, if you haven't heard of Brilliant, they're one of the top online learning platforms for STEM although they do things a little differently. Instead of just sitting back and watching videos, you actually get involved. You click, you drag, and you test ideas. It honestly feels more like working through a puzzle than studying. On Brilliant, things are also personalized. So whether you're just starting out or wanting to deepen your knowledge, the experience adapts to your background and how well you're performing. One topic in particular I think civil engineers and students should check out is their programming track. Most civil majors barely touch any programming at university, but in practice, being able to automate tasks, organize data, or even build small tools will make you way more effective. And I think the way Bruin gets you hands-on with the topics until they make sense will help you build genuine understanding fast. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash bnghilsha, scan the QR code on screen, or click the link in the description. Brilliant's also been kind enough to give my viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to it. Now, by this point, your design should be buildable, clear, and predictable but now you need to make sure that the builder doesn't accidentally break it before the structure can actually support itself. And this is where most new engineers fall short. They assume the risks are obvious, they're not. Your designs might be structurally perfect on paper, but unless you spell out the temporary conditions and critical sequences in big, bold, clear language, something will eventually go wrong on site. Because here's what really catches builders off guard. Most structural failures don't happen when the building is finished, they happen during construction, when things are partially built, partially supported, and far from acting like the final structure you analyzed. A retaining wall looks solid, so someone backfills it too early. A basement excavation looks stable, so they skip or delay installing shoring to speed things up. A beam on the lower floor looks like it's carrying the column above, when in reality, the column is picking up the beam, and the beam only works after the upper framing has been installed. None of these are obvious from a drawing, and unless you explicitly warn the builder, they'll do whatever they want. That's why this rule really matters, because if you don't over communicate the risks, you leave the builder to fill in the blanks, and the blanks are where things crack, move, fail, or collapse. So here's exactly what to do. Write oversized, bold, crystal clear notes anywhere a temporary condition carries risk. For example, on a cantilever retaining wall detail, there should be a big note saying that the backfill is not to be installed until the footing and wall has reached design strength. If you have a basement excavation near a neighboring property, don't just reference temporary shoring by contractor, tell them explicitly that the excavation requires temporary shoring and that the wall design assumes that shoring has been installed and maintained throughout construction. And if you have anything unusual, like lower level beams that only work because columns are picking them up from the floor above, call that out. Tell them the sequence. Builders don't mind clear instructions. What they hate is ambiguity because ambiguity is where they lose time, money, and safety. Anyway, if you wanna see what my day-to-day -day looks like as a structural engineer, you should watch this video next and I'll see you over there. Bye-bye.